Boy District yeah. uh, uh, Quartet Champions, Jay France. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Well, I'm sure you all know who I am by now, so let's go ahead and get started. Ooh, this who am I? Uh, I'll tell you in 50 minutes. Uh, so, what we're going to be talking about today is so the course name is Make the Song Come Alive. But we're going to kind of dive into what that means. So, making the song come alive is kind of split into two parts. And one of the parts is the performative aspect, which is what goes on up here on your face. And the other part is the you know, vocally expressive aspect, which is how we shape the lyrics and how we sing the lyrics to make them more musical. And that's kind of the part that I wanted to focus on today. So this class is kind of going to be divided into two parts. We're going to first go over the tools necessary to give yourself the most freedom to be musical. And then the second part, if I have a willing volunteer, we will apply the things we have learned and do kind of a mini coaching under glass kind of thing. And you guys can see how we can effectively rehearse with the tools that I've gone over and apply them. So. Uh, there's two main things that must be answered when learning how to be vocally artistic. The first question is, what tools as a singer, as a vocalist, do I have to, be, to, to have artistry? And the second thing is, when do I do those things? So the first thing we're going to talk about is what tools I have as a singer. So there's many different things you can do with your voice aside from singing the accurate pitch to make for a pleasant listening experience you know there's many a times there's performances that we see in our hobby that are very pleasant to listen to you know thank you there's very pleasant where was that pleasant listening experience there's many <laughs> performances in our hobby that make for a pleasant listening experience you know the chorus goes up they sing the right notes they have a resemblance of a story they may have an image in mind but it doesn't really go anywhere and you're left as an audience member wanting more. So what can we do as vocalists to you know, take the song off the paper and make it a living, breathing entity? So there's four main things that we kind of have as options that we can experiment with. The first being dynamics, you know, how loud, how soft do we sing? Doing things louder and sometimes softer is a way to add emphasis to certain lyrics that may be important. We can also add extra diction to those lyrics as well, really emphasizing all of the syllables in the words as well to you know, add emphasis to that word. We can change the tempo, how fast or how slow we sing, to add emphasis as well. Providing a change of pace will provide for a more intriguing listening experience. And then finally, this is maybe the most complex of the four, is the timbre of the voice so like, are we using twang? Are we singing with a breathier tone? Are we singing with a more forward and brighter tone? Are we singing with a darker tone? These are all things we can experiment with as well to add variety to the song. So the next question is, when do I apply those things? Gee, it's great that I know what the tools are in my arsenal, when do I use them? And there's this idea that you may remember from our good friend, Cy Wood, that I really wanted to iterate over again, called prosody words. So prosody is this study in the English language of pretty much everything that has to do with the language that isn't the phonetic sounds, the vowels and consonants. So how, how do we add infliction to the way we speak to make for better communication between two people, make for a, you know, a better dialogue, and that can be applied to singing as well. So I'm, I'm trying to think of a good example here. So, so if you ask me, so, so Tyler asked me, how are you, Shane? How are you, Shane? I'm fine, I'm fine. Ask me, how are you again? How are you, Shane? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. So I, I said the same words, same vowels, same consonants, but I can do two different meanings, all right? So the question becomes, how do we know which words to change the meaning on in our, in our music? And there's some general rules, but you can, you know, if you really study the lyrics to yourself, you may find more opportunities beyond this, which is what I encourage you to do. 
So the first words you kind of want to look at are descriptor words. Um, most particularly adjectives and adverbs are really important um, as they in themselves modify either a noun or a verb to give it a certain emphasis or more important. Is it a kiss or a lovely kiss? You know, that changes things. And we as singers, it is our jobs to put emphasis on that the way that the original composer did. The other thing to think of is conjunctions, you know, and, for, but, yet, because conjunctions join two thoughts, they join two phrases, and either continue an idea or pivot directions. So those are important to look at as well. Also, descriptors of time are important to look at as well. It's very important as an audience that we have the knowledge of the chronological time of the piece, and that may give the, the listener more context as to what they're listening to. Um, fourth would be, anytime we have repetition, I'm sure you've heard this before, if we're repeating something two or three times, if we say it the same way every time, we're gonna lose people. So we need to add more in those moments, up here and with the voice, to really make that come out. And then finally, would be terms of endearment. So, you know, love is a very strong emotion, so anytime we, you know, have love or friendship, and words that, phrases that bring that out, they need to, they need to be out there. So, I guess before we move on, does anyone have any questions or anything they want to clarify before we move into the second part? You in the front, handsome woman in the front. Could you move two steps to your Can left? Can I move two steps to the left? Thank you. That's my mother, everyone. Um, all right. I, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, any, other, any other questions? Or should we jump in? So, okay, so no questions yet. So, kind of what I wanted to do in this second part is take the things we have applied and put them into practice. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna have kind of a mini rehearsal that you may do on your own time, and it'll be an opportunity for you to see how we as singers can experiment with those tools and make for a more interesting experience. So, with that being said, do I have a volunteer that would love to sing through one of our contest pieces <clears throat> with me and try something? I'm not seeing any hands. <laughs> Elliot, you're a trooper. Give it up. <laughs> I'm just checking the time. All right. Okay. Wow. I know you're going to check If you need the music. So, which, which of the two contest pieces would you prefer to work on? Which you feel more comfortable on? How lucky you are, and this music. Or if there's anything else, any music we've sung in the past, would you really feel? Sure, go ahead. Uh, oh, does anyone have a pitch pipe? Tyler, you have a pitch pipe. I know you don't. I do. I have one. Long story. Can I have one? Uh, Shane, you are a pitch pipe. Yeah, is it F? A, a flat? A flat. Did you want to do it in that? Days can be sunny, but skies turn to gray. Is that good for you? Yeah. All right, uh, I'll count you in. You want to just do the intro? Sure. And then you can stop there? All right, one, two, three. Days can be sunny, and skies turn to gray. Life's really funny that way. So strap yourself in, take a good with the band. Lesson for today. All right, give me a hand. Good. So, thank you for thank you for being brave enough to come up here. So first of all, excellent job. You know, you have a nice tone, and we're just gonna kind of work through making that come off the page more. So let's kind of let's kind of speak through these lyrics, okay? So we have days can be sunny, but conjunction skies turn to gray. So we have the sunny. So, Glory of Love as a song is all about those contrasts, right? You have to win a little, but you have to lose a little. You gotta give a little, but you gotta take a little. So, anytime we have a contrast like that, or two opposing ideas, there needs to be some sort of shift in the way we present that, right? So, based on the tools we have, let's try to find 
the best one to kind of slot into the beginning there. Because we have the days turning to sunny, skies turning to gray. So. So like more of a dynamic thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, do you want to try like, days can be sunny if it's skies turn to gray? Yeah. Get a little bit softer there. Uh, a flat again. Thank you. A one, two, three. Days can be sunny in sky, but skies turn to gray. Yeah, and yeah. It's really funny that way. So do we, is it butter and? Uh, days can be sunny, but sky, yeah, but skies turn to gray. Yeah. Play it's really fun. Yeah, so. Already, that's a little bit more interesting, right? So, anytime we have those conjunctions, you know, but and for, that's a change in ideas, we're up pivot, so we can kind of work off of and, that. And when we sing out the but or and or the conjunction, should it be emphasized so that pe so the audience understands? You, the, 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 the we don't necessarily need to emphasize the conjunction word itself. It's more of an indicator that something is changing. So, you know, days can be sunny if we say that with energy um, the sky screen of gray, you know, that could be a dynamic shift. But it doesn't necessarily need to happen on the butt. Okay. It can just be used as a pivot. Yeah. So days can be sunny if the sky's turn to gray. And then life's really fun. You know, life's really funny that way. So already a new idea. <laughs> Three ideas back to back to back that can all be different. Um, hmm. Do you want let's let's go a little bit more forward into the song. Do you want to go past the intro? You gotta give a little take. A two is a nail. A one, a two. Okay. You want to just start? <laughs> you gotta give a little, take a little. Let your poor heart break a little. That's the story of. That's the glory of love. Very good. Very good. So once again, we have those two changing ideas. You gotta give a little, but you gotta take a little. And let your poor heart break a little. You know, three ideas right there. And then what do we have right after that? We have repetition. That's the story. That's the glory of love. So let's, let's try something a little bit more, I guess, refined than dynamics. We can, we can play around with maybe the how forward we sing, how bright we sing. So maybe one phrase could be, you know, in this in this bright space, you know, right up here, here, kitty, kitty, kitty. And one could be, you know, really that holy moly. So how I would kind of approach this is, you've got to give a little, take a little. One is kind of the positive aspect of the of the comparison, and one is the negative. So maybe I would have the positive be that you know, the brighter tone, and then bring it back. So how I would kind of sing through is, you gotta give a little, take a little, bring it back, take a little, and let your poor heart break a little. You know, can add a you know, dynamic, heartbreaking, you know, that's pretty, pretty serious. So we can add something there, and then we have that, you know, repetition right after. That's the story of, that's the glory of love, you know. Adding those simple crescendos on any held note is very good. And for the portion that's the story of the story of love, should it be more nasally than back? I wouldn't say nasal. We want to have a healthy tone. Yeah, just re-emphasized, I think, is the more important thing. I think the quality is going to be different for each singer. But a re that's the story of, that's the glory of love. You know. I try not to think of what I'm giving you as like a specific thing you should be doing. The main goal of this course is just to get you and everyone else thinking. You know, get you guys thinking about, hey, what can I do at home or how would, how would I rehearse at home? And so what I'm, what I'm giving you is not necessarily the right answer, but it should be used as kind of a how would I improve on my own kind of thing. So how would I rehearse this at home? This is how I rehearse at home. And I'm kind of giving you tools for that. Do you wanna do you wanna keep going on that song or just keep going forward? Yeah, so 
But once again, we have that, that emphasis, that's the story of, that's the glory of love, the glory of love. And then, what do we have right after? So, loud and laugh a little, once again, positive. Cry a little more somber. So, you gotta laugh a little, cry a little, you know. You can, we, we can use a breathier tone there, we can use a darker tone, we can get quieter, there's so many options there. Um, is there one you wanted to experiment with as a change in there? Um, I think going back in time, probably. Just like a darker, holy, 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 holy. Yeah, we can try a darker tone there. You want to try that? Yeah. All right. Mm. And then once again another. That's the story of that's the glory of love. That's the glory of love. I think it goes into the next part there. So once again, so there's this this song was great because there's so many shifts in emotion all all right after each other. So it gives us a lot of opportunity. It's very tricky. So, you know, you have that laugh, got to laugh a little, cry a little, that's a shift. Let the clouds roll by a little, that's a little, you know, a little more relaxing than crying, you know. So, you could, you could, how would I, how would I do this, you know. If we're, if we're sticking with the brighter versus dark thing, we could maybe have less activation in the voice. And, and let the clouds roll by a little, and then switch it to a less breathy tone after, could be good. That's the story of. That's the glory of. Whatever. Be more prominent with the. Yeah, it's it's once again it's just to add contrast. Yeah. We're just doing things that makes the audience want to listen. If I sang this in a mezzo, whatever the whole time, and didn't do anything, the audience doesn't care. If I'm making choices and being deliberate with every lyric I sing, even if it's not in theory the correct choice, the audience is paying attention more. And then when you refine it, that's where that's where the artistry comes in. Um, so where where would you want to start, Kelly? Is there anything you wanted to experiment with? Um, yeah. Do <laughs> you have any questions? Or? Um, just yeah. Uh, do you want to do you want to kind of recap or from the from the you got a little bit of old tape, a little old with everything we tried. Yeah, sure. Gotta give a little, take a little, let your poor heart break a little. That's the story of, that's the glory of love. Can you hold up the words break a little bit longer? I just want to try something else. Take a little and let your poor heart break a little. That's the story, you know, yeah. adding emphasis, right, on those prosody words. Yeah. All right. You gotta give a little, you gotta give a little, take a little, let the poor heart break a little. There you go. Yeah. That's the story of, that's the glory of love. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you guys have any thoughts on anything? Or things you could try? Yeah, so basically you're saying that before we start the song, it's a good idea to sit down with the music and circle those places exactly. where there are prosody words and where those exactly. conjunctions happen, where you want to emphasize certain things or de-emphasize exactly. certain things before you even start singing. So. Exactly. So when you get a new piece of music as a singer, before jumping in, you really need to analyze what your purpose is. So one of the things that I do when I get a piece of music is I try to figure out what is my main goal of singing this? By the end of this song, what do I want to accomplish? Um, so, what could be a, a possible end goal for Glory of Love, do you guys think? Okay, depending on realization. What, so by the end of this song, I want to accomplish what? What do I want to accomplish? Who am I talking to? What do I need to deliver to them through these lyrics? Exactly. Yeah. 
hey, I'm with you through the good and the bad, but even through the bad, it's gonna be okay, right? So, hey, there may be good things, there may be bad things, but it's, it's a comforting song, it's a fun song, it's an upbeat song for sure, but it's, it's meant to be, it's meant to comfort someone. So that comfort comes from honesty, because we're, we're putting those negatives on display. We're not sugarcoating anything with these lyrics. So it's very important that the emotions are honest as well, right? Um, but yeah, that is a very good point. So anytime we get a new piece of music, it's very important that we sit down and really analyze these lyrics, okay? Because that's where the test of your lyrics. Yeah, yeah, so also halfway through the song, it's, um, uh, and when the world is through with this, we got each other gone. Yeah. So for this, that it's a very minute detail, but throughout the whole song, you have to have in mind, there's this one person, whoever is listening to you, the person that you're speaking to in the song, has to satisfy mm -hmm. that condition, which means they're probably going to be like a loved one of yours. Exactly. Right? So even though mm -hmm. none of the other lyrics in the whole song uh, even allude to that, knowing that it's even there to begin with will inform you how to sing the rest of the song. Exactly. Very good point. So, yeah, Phil? I was going to say, okay, so each one of us go through the music. We have our own interp on how what the song is we like. The problem that I see here is that when we go with the chorus, my idea of what I was going to sing here may not be the same as exactly. Tyler's, or maybe not be the same we all have to be reading from the same page. Right, so Arisers. this works well in a quartet. Now in a chorus, obviously you have to be on the same page interp-wise, but rehearsal I, in, a, in a perfect world should not be the place where we learn notes and words. That should be done at home when you're circling the music. Rehearsal is a place where we come together and we bounce all those ideas off of each other that we learned at home and come, with, come up with a consensus. So what I'm saying is not necessarily the perfect solution, and what Tyler is saying may not be the perfect solution. But if we can come together and kind of agree on something that we're all buying into, then we can work from there. If we're wasting time in the beginning on these, on these you know, notes and words that we could be doing at home, we can never get to this point and we can never be artistic, and we're gonna be stuck. But if we, you know, if the goal with, with this lesson is to become a smarter singer and become a more attentive singer, and to really be like paying attention to what you're actually singing, so that when you come to rehearsal, you can be a little bit more, you know, engaged and like prepared, and we can, we can have those prepared. discussions. What a concept. <laughs> right. Your comment about Exchanging ideas in rehearsal implies strongly that we don't. We need to do more than just learn the notes and words. We need to do this analysis and come up with at least a starting point ourselves in terms of emotionally. What's the song telling us? You know, we're in this particular song. There's a single person that we're speaking this song to, so we can all have a mental image of who that person is mm -hmm. for us. The director won't give us that person. We yeah. have to bring that. Exactly. Yeah, that person's going to be different for anyone. And the way you described it, that should be a session as part of the rehearsal. And when people have gone home and prepared and mm -hmm. gone through the process, of words, and we all get together and we spend some time and we hash out, how do we want this to end up as a chorus? Exactly. And obviously, you know, Mitch as the director, he's going to kind of have the final say in that. But rather than letting him kind of take it and run with it, and then he comes up with something that we're not buying into, we can give him ideas, because you know, Mitch is open to reception, and if we're giving <laughs> him ideas, and he's buying in, and like we're all, the goal is to create a, a product that we're passionate about, all right? And coming up with these things at home, and coming to rehearsal with plans that you would feel like you want to put on stage and you feel enthusiastic about is something that your director will notice. Yeah. Yeah, something else too that um, 
like the whole point of, of giving us the tools mm -hmm. to be able to add artistry mm -hmm. is so that if you were going to try to sing the song by yourself and you sang it through and Mitch told you, okay, now add artistry without any specific um, goal in mind, you, you, you know what you can try. You exactly. Know, you, you wouldn't be um, and that's unsure, what our unsure what to do. You right. have the tools. You can say, okay, I can try this, I can try this. And that is what a rehearsal is for. Yeah. So rather than you know getting getting the notes and words out of the way first gives you the baseline to just do what you can artist wise. And in rehearsal, we can try, you know, what if I say this at a slower tempo? What if this was a dynamic change? And any, any idea that pops to your head when you're reading the music can be something you discuss with your music team or your director and possibly get it into the final intro plan. If Mitch is doing all this work by himself, it's gonna make for a slower process. But if all of us are smarter singers and we're all bringing our specialties and ideas to the table, and that is, you know, the music, the music product is getting refined, then we will sooner arrive at a final product that we're happy with, and then we can, you know, get a package together. Anyone else have any other ideas there? Yeah, so uh, the more people practice this this exercise of thinking of ways to add um, artistry to a song, the better you're going to get, which means during rehearsal, everyone is probably going to converge onto the same ideas quicker than if people are not practiced in this. If you're used to being told what to do, and then you have to practice doing that, instead of just practicing in general the the form that is art and finding a way to make a good product without someone else telling you how to do it, then in the end it's, it's going to be a lot more efficient, um, a lot less cumbersome, and people are going to have a better time. There are, there are many courses that exist that have directors that are very good directors, but they're good in the way that they can get what they want out of their singers rather than making them smarter. So when the director goes, everything else does too. And now we don't have a baseline. Because we've learned by rote this artistry without really understanding why we're doing it or where it should be done or even what tools we have. And when we don't have someone feeding that in, then we, we don't have a reference. So that's kind of what I wanted to do today is give you guys, you know, the arsenal needed to do this on your own and to become a smarter singer individually. And if we're all becoming better and smarter individually, the whole force will improve. Even on different inter. Right? Zella. Zella. Yeah. Yeah. I got 20 minutes left. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> One summary of, of all the all the points, because you know you just just like a, a do you, list of things. Yeah. Do you want to recap the list again? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Before you do that, you you started out saying that we're going to do it on our own. Great. That's right. fine. And then you said you identified four areas where there are tools. Mm -hmm. So the question is, if we want to continue our own education in the tools within those four areas, mm -hmm. what references should we be looking at? Or, you know, is it just right. a matter of like listening to other yeah. people? Yeah, so the, the list I gave was not necessarily all-inclusive. There's a ton of different ways to be artistic that can be applied in very minute situations. I tried to give the most general ones yeah. that can be applied anywhere. Um, but really the biggest resource that we have is just listening to the art form and understanding the style. I mean, we've seen it with the Music Man on Broadway, with that quartet. There's, there's so many competent singers that are really good singers and are excellent, but they come into our art form and they're lost and they don't know what to do because they just don't understand it. Right? There's a difference between knowing a lot and understanding, right? and understanding how things work. And to understand, you have to immerse yourself and really listen to Barbershop a lot. Personally, I listen to Barbershop casually several hours a day. 
in the back. I'm in the background most of the time, but I'm always picking those things up because I'm getting, I'm gathering ideas to become smarter and to become more prepared for the next challenge I have musically. And that's really where it starts, you know. Yeah. So yeah, um, along the lines of, of listening to improve why we do what we do, uh, a good question to ask, like if you're listening to something and you hear something that you like or you don't like, just think, okay, why? What made that effective? Mm -hmm. What made that not so effective to me personally? And think about the emotions associated with it. Why did it make me feel this way? Um, and is there any way that I could apply uh, that? Yeah, steal those tricks. Yeah. Right? Um, I forget what the quote is, but there's, there's I think this, I remember yeah, about. There's this quote about <laughs> the mediocre artists take for the best steal or something like that. Yeah, good artists copy and the best steal. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but this isn't something that you have to do in a vacuum. Yeah. Learn what it is other people do that is successful, and then figure out a way to make that make sense to yourself. So presumably we're all here. Hey, okay, a flat by the way. Presumably we're all here <laughs> because we enjoy barbershop, right? And you kind of had to ask yourself, what is it about barbershop that I connect with? And for me personally, it's hearing these kinds of choices that people make that give them, that puts their personality on stage, right? Singers are human, and there's very human and authentic emotions that are happening. We get very vulnerable. How does that come across in the way we sing, right? That's what I really buy into. So as you said, anytime I'm listening to music and there's something that they do, and I'm like, wow, apart from, wow, they tune that chord well, why did it resonate with me? And more importantly, how can I steal that? Well, steal is a strong word, but how can I <laughs> implement that and maybe. apply it to my own music and maybe make someone else feel those emotions and make them want to do what we do, right? <clears throat> yep. yes. I've watched really artistic choruses on the international stage that we generally are in the top five. Mm -hmm. And that what I've noticed is two things. One, there's always well, almost always, one or two people that are not part of the program. They're, and what I find is the more artistic the chorus is, the more noticeable and distracting it is when you have one or two people that have not done their homework. Mm -hmm. And you can tell that there's always one or two that are unfortunately in that role. So I just, yeah. it, the point being, everyone has to sort of, in an ensemble, everybody has to buy into, do their best because it, you know the weakest link will, will be will show up in that mm -hmm. case. And now, what other comment I was going to make is that the more artistic the chorus is, the more in tune it sings. Yeah, that kind of works both ways. It's like a vicious, or not a vicious. Case, I don't know if you've read a score sheet lately, but all the three categories are the numbers are generally around each other because they do all buy in. They all they're all connected. If you don't, I once asked after hours. When do you start doing interp when you learn a song? And they said right from the start. No matter what happens, they don't just jump in and start doing the words and music. The interp is so much woven into a part of what they do. That's why their end product looks the way it does and sounds the way it does. Because mm -hmm. everything is woven together. I like that you said end product because that's it's really important when you get a new piece of music to as soon as possible figure out what your end product is and what you're working towards, all right? If you're firing shots aimlessly and you don't know where you want to be in the end, you're gonna have an incomplete product because you never knew what the product was to begin with. So many choruses, you know, you take ambassadors with their set from last year when they won. I guarantee you, their whole music team knew exactly what, the, what that was gonna look like in November on stage. And they had that figured out because it was carefully planned and it was meticulous. And then the rest of that was getting everyone to buy into what their image is. And so kind of our goal is to have the image in our heads from the start of what we wanna be come showtime. And then the rest is just 
getting there, right? So that's really where we have to start. So, yeah. Maybe this is less, it applies less to leads in our style. Mm -hmm. but for base, I, I have to do this a lot. So like, can you yeah. talk about how you identify like what your goal is mm -hmm. in different parts of the song? Like right. say, we're gonna rehearse Send in the Clowns later. That's a huge one. It's like, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a solo for 90% of the song and the other three parts are, are a trio that is along for the ride almost. Mm -hmm. Like we could be a distraction or, you know, we're not going to do what they're listening to unless we screw it up kind of thing. Right. So this goes back to the idea of understanding the piece and rather than just knowing. So when I get a new piece of music, I'll memorize my part, but at the same time, I'm looking at the other three parts and seeing what are they, I need to understand when the melody gets traded or what they're doing, like how they fit into what I'm doing. And it's a little bit harder, I guess, because of the lead. To, uh, but it's very important to understand those other parts and like what their goal is and when they get the melody and you know what they're supposed to be doing, because then that makes your individual plan stronger. If you're a bass and you're on percussive syllables the whole time, but the leads are having all these emotional changes and you're not doing anything, then there's a mismatch. Right? So even on percussion, or if you're if I'm a lead and I'm posting and there's lyrics going on over here, I gotta I gotta add emotion to what he's doing, right? And add that into what I'm doing. Right? Uh, performance judge that I'm good friends with, his name is James Pennington. He told me that the different the only difference between a 70 and an 80 in performance is if Everyone is on the same page. We might all be, as a quartet, we might all be emoting. We might all be buying in. But if it's not unified, and if what I'm doing is different from what my baritone's doing, then that creates a distraction, right? You're graded as a unit, right? Not necessarily as 40 individuals, which means it's very important for us to all to get on the same page as soon as possible when we get the chart and come up with these plans immediately and work from there rather than coming up with that at the very end and then we're not on the same page and we're divided in our message. Yeah. Yeah, generally speaking there is no one size fit all answer for what do the harmony parts do when you don't have words. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes if the soloist comes out and starts doing their solo, you're listening to them. Mm -hmm. Right? Because I mean there are several instances New Fangle Four has had comedy bits where whoever's doing the solo is talking to the other guys, right? Mm -hmm. um, but in a valid situation like this, most typically it will be that you have to take the message that the soloist is delivering. Mm -hmm. um, who's the quartet that got Eleven? Yeah. Maple, Maple Reserve. Maple Reserve. Maple Reserve. Maple Reserve is really good at that. Look them right. up. Listen to, listen yeah. to the barbershop. The yeah. lead is a phenomenal um, communicator of his emotions. And when the other three aren't speaking his words, they are working it. They look like his words. It's kind of amazing. And the way they sing their harmony parts and their non-word, you know, phonetics, would it, it's as if they were singing the words. It's as if they were the lead. All four singers are singing as if they were the lead. And nobody is, you know, in, the, in those top 20 quartets, and any of those quartets at International, nobody's lazy about it. And everyone's very attentive, right? Um, let's see, how much time do we have left? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Or, yeah, ten. Okay. Um, yeah. No, the clock. Oh, good point. Oh, hey. Um, <laughs> yeah. That would have been good to know about forty-one minutes ago. Um, Watch. But yeah. So, yeah. How how coupled do you think the physical look is with the Vocal. Um, I think they're very more. correlated, and I think understanding the that super objective of the song, you know, by the end of the song, what do I want to accomplish, and knowing how each lyric gets you there allows you to make informed choices on both. And if we know what this overall message is, we can 
in tandem work our performance and musical plan to you know make sense when we put together because we have the engine in mind. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, one other one. When you started out the whole thing, you had um, they asked you how how your day was or how you're doing. Right. So it would almost seem like a, a good exercise here would be to take a single phrase. Mm -hmm. And then say, okay, now you're going to sing this happy. Now you're going to sing this mm. sad. Now you're going to sing this one melancholy. And, and physically pick those things, and then try and see what tools mm. you would have to get you to express that concept with that same phrase. Yeah. So you guys have all done vocal warmups, right? Do we do we ever do performance warmups? Because that's that's something we can warm up too. Is getting in the mood for what we're about to do. And like you said, experimenting and practicing with shifting those moods at a rapid pace and knowing what it feels like to have those emotions and kind of experimenting with them. Um, there's actually a very good video on YouTube that implements your idea. Um, if you've heard of Jacob Collier, Grammy-nominated musician, he plays, I think it's Happy Birthday, like 30 different ways with all these different emotions. And it's very informative. And you know, if you really pay attention, you, you understand the choices he's making, and it's 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 it can be very much applied to Thorpe Shop, right? I think one of the things that I like about Barber Shop is that you have the expression and the storytelling, as opposed to other kinds of vocal music. I know all my kids can't sing in school choirs, and at the school they went to, at least the high school they. Went it's almost as if the teacher, the choir teachers, had an aversion to the kids singing in English. They would give them these songs in Latin or in Swahili or in whatever, I, yeah, I <laughs> to make sure that they had no idea what they were actually saying and were singing the notes and the, you know, yeah. So, yeah, and, and were singing the notes. So that brings to the point is, is we, I was in a coaching session in high school, we were singing in French and our, our coach was, so what are you guys singing about? And none of us knew, because we never took the time to like Google Translate the lyrics or anything. And like, like who would have thought? So that so that's kind of the difference between fine art and folk art. And barbershop is a kind of folk art where we have that freedom of expression and those dynamic markings and those crescendos aren't given to you as a singer. And you kind of come up with those on your own, which is the beauty of it, because you can really craft it to your personality. When we're singing, you know, Mozart or we're playing Beethoven, we don't change what Beethoven did because he's Beethoven. It, he, he put that in there because he said so, right? <laughs> That's the reason it's there. Why Beethoven's he right, so? yeah. right? He's the customer. The customer is always right. But but in barbershop, we don't have that, and it's uh, I prefer it personally because I don't want to listen to Beethoven, but yeah. <laughs> I think there was a class I took in Harmony U one time where they talked about how different soloists can sell a song, mm -hmm. you know. And you watch a very a good soloist, Frank Sinatra, for example, or Bird and Peters, as a matter of fact, I think they brought that one out. And she sang, I can't remember what the song was, but the emotion and the and the just the how they completely immerse themselves in the song. And then they sing it, and it comes out. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know whether that's coached or whether, however, they, they get that. But you see, the end result is just an incredible, you know, conveyance of of what the song is about and the message of the song and everything that goes with it. Some singers can do that. Some <coughs> Sinatra, in particular, was one of the first to really utilize the microphone and think about the piece from the listener's perspective of what they would hear on the other end. And he was very good at you know, knowing where to be in the room and how to speak so that it would come across better on the microphone. He was very good at that. But yeah, so how do we add personality? Well, that's where that toolbox comes from. And I've given a pretty standardized outline, but to expand on that and grow even beyond that, it takes listening to the style and understanding the style. And that's something that we can all do. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier about um, facial expression and how much it adds to emotion or yeah. emotional feeling. 
Yeah, so performance and musicality are very tied together. And it's important that, you know, what's going on here and what's coming out, you know, when you're singing are tied together so that it makes sense for our audience. You know, if we're, if we're singing a happy song, but we, you know, look like our dog died up here, then it's not gonna make sense for the listener and we're gonna lose them. And the best quartets and the best singers are very good at matching those and aligning them so that the, youth, the, the, the listener doesn't get lost and everything makes sense, right? Uh, all right, I think we have like a minute left. Does anyone want to? Yeah, so the, the list again. What's it? What's no, three, the, list. the list again. Um, so for toolbox, dynamics, diction, timbre, and tempo are the four big ones. And as to when to change, we can we can look at first descriptor words, you know, adjectives, adverbs, conjunctions, um, passive words that like signify time, repeat repetition. Anytime we repeat something, I think it's you, right? We say it's you a million times. Every single time you say it's you has to be different. Right? I sang Maria for a recital last December. And what me and my vocal coach worked on was every time I say Maria, it has to be different. And a new feeling has to be felt internally from this character. You know, he's not saying it again just because he feels like it. It's because he has a new reason to say it again for the umpteenth time, right? So we have descriptors, conjunctions, passage of time, re repetition, and then terms of endearment, right? That, that idea of love and camaraderie and friendship. That's a strong emotion that needs to be brought out because it's an emotion that a lot of people can relate to, okay? All right, well, yeah, thank you guys.